Houston contact with a test. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. End of test. Discovery Houston, recommend uh, vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery four computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Gilles Bugin, sitting in front of the computer, is trying to type. He places both hands above the keyboard. He gives up, exhausted, and his hands drop into his lap. After resting for a time, he raises his hands again, only to drop them as before. My definition of electronic literature is, I want to say stories, because I always associate stories with literature. And electronic means that there has been either some intervention in the authoring process, which involves digital technology, or in the delivery process, which has I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents beset by fear, and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon, the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says, without emotion, one way or another. I wrote this in Michigan. I actually can remember the sound of on freezing days. They may not, may not have been oaks exploding, but the trees kind of popping off along the ridge. And I remember also having walked to my office and seen the afternoon melt freezing across the blacktop like crystal octopi. I'm having an incredible deja vu looking at this screen. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. A check tablecloth lay in an isolated clearing. A bottle of red wine, two glasses of cheese and bread. Walking the sound of water. water. Wait, cabinet the sound of water. Or a bottle Wait, of cabinet cabinet sauvignon set or on a bottle of cabinet sauvignon set on a green tablecloth. Cold water. Cold water. Crystal goblets Four. unexpectedly Crystal at midnight. Crystal goblets unexpectedly at midnight. Purple lupine on the hillside. Beside the Dempsey dumpster in town. Walking down to the water where the homeless gather. A flower, a flower dress, dress, unexpected woodland events, wait, cabinet spring water in winter, a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a linen tablecloth, cold, cold water. water, a flower dress, the smell of hops and honey, the smell of green in grass, the outflow of the stone by the river, the a smell of green door. grass, under the eaves of the by the river, the, the cabin where we were working, the sound of water. White capped mountains, purple lupine on the hillside, making love. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context uh, to achieve uh, effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My breath takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen. Or it took place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell, when that's possible in the future. At the present, it starts with image very dominantly and proceeds through text to sound in kind of a, a hierarchy, which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions both at the code, the sonic, 
the visual and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means. And in traditional vision-based media, you have moving pictures, you have more traditional genres, such as you know printed text where things don't move around. But electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts, how we perceive the world and ourselves, and trying to portray that using computation, using the specific processes that are unique to computers. There are two main literary parents for me, for, for the fiction. And one of them is Thomas Pynchon mm -hmm. and um, Gravity's Rainbow, which is a novel which contains within it music hall numbers, popular songs, equation, uh, there are there are no composing a culture with one work upon another. The Pathfinders Project is a preservation project that aims to make electronic literature available for generations beyond us. This project is very important because if you think about it, early digital literature represents a cultural moment and a historical change in the way we think about literature. In Pathfinders, we used a concept called traversal, a way of capturing author and user interactions on the work's original platform. I wanted the reader to feel that there were distinctly different human stories. This is fundamentally embodied. It sounds like somebody told me it was their bedtime story every day. and. Uh, it was a lot of fun to do, and I also found telling the story that way appealed to the social media nature of, of the audience. We think this method of preservation in conjunction with things like migration and emulation will keep crucial works alive so that future readers can better understand them. Without a doubt, we have the potential to transform the field of digital media preservation. This multimedia book is just the beginning. Welcome to the third of seven live stream traversals from the new and improved MOVE studio um, as part of the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Deanie Grigard, the director of the lab and professor of the Creative Media and Digital Culture program here at the university. Today, we have Richard Holton, the author of Fagurski at Finhorn on Acid, who will perform his hypertext novel for us. This work was published in 2001 by Eastgate Systems, Inc., and it was published on CD-ROM. You'll notice that he's going to be reading this off a G3 iMac, um, a G4 iMac lampshade, circa 2002-2004. This event is part of the Born Digital Media Preservation Series sponsored by WSUV, uh, Washington State University, Vancouver's Lewis E. and Sela G. Buchanan Distinguished Professorship and the Electronic Literature Organization. In the online audience today, we have many, many, many people, including graduate students and undergraduate students, both taking electronic literature courses um, at Pullman and Vancouver, and we thank you all for attending. You're probably wondering what's meant by a traversal, and this is a process developed for the Pathfinders project by Stuart Malthrop and me that we define as audio and video recording of a demonstration performed on a historically appropriate platform by an author or reader of the work. And as I mentioned, we're using a very old 13-year-old computer right now um, that's reading a CD-ROM. The Pathfinders methodology was created for preserving interactive work like Richard's and media-rich uh, works um, that cannot be captured in print. It also includes, along with the traversal, um, photographs of the artifact, a detailed description of the material artifacts, sound files, essays, his, you know, historical information about the work, its performances and ex exhibitions, and its impact on culture. Assisting today is Nicholas Schiller, the Associate Director of, of the Electronic Literature Lab, John Barber, CMDC faculty, who's also a sound artist, uh, Greg Philbrook, the Instructional and Technology uh, Specialist for the CMDC program, and the Electronic Literature Fellows, Mariah Gwen, Monica Roth, Andrew Nevu, as Kathleen Zoller, 
Holly Slocum, who's online with us today, and Austin Field. The link to this live stream will be archived at the L website, which we will be posting on Facebook and Twitter for you. Our Facebook channel and Twitter hashtag is ELIT Pathfinders and ELIT Lab. Richard will be performing this work for about 40 minutes and will follow his performance with a Q&A. And those of you who are online can post your questions into the uh, YouTube chat, which I'll be monitoring as ELIT Pathfinders and will be monitored also by Nicholas Schiller. Those of you in the lab in the space today um, live can ask your questions live to Richard. And we'll get started. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dee Dee, for that, for that introduction, and just a, a really warm thank you to the terrific team at Washington State University, Vancouver, uh, for making all this possible. And I just want to acknowledge the studio audience, literally a studio audience, <laughs> uh, and including some dear friends who have traveled from a distance to be here, uh, and the uh, online folks, welcome to you too. So, Figursky at Findhorn on Acid is a hypertext novel and uh, just show the, uh, the CD uh, jewel case that that Dini was referring to and this is the form it came in and I'll show that on the camera I think um, when you load it up on the computer if you can see on the screen you get the first thing you see the software it says begin a new reading or resume a previous reading so we're going to jump right in and uh, begin a new reading. If you're really quick with your eyes, you may have seen the software loading 354 spaces, which are writing spaces or nodes or Lexia, and 2001 links. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll refer back to those numbers uh, shortly. Uh, here, the first screen you see is some extensive instructions and guidelines this seemed necessary at the time, even though um, the web had been around for a few years. Uh, the story space software is uh, a little specific, and it seemed necessary to provide help for the reader. Uh, I'm not going to read the instructions for you, but what I am going to do is uh, I'll highlight four or five of the main ways to navigate through the hypertext, and then um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll experience some of those. And the first and a primary way is that there's a default route to go from screen to screen that I built into the work. And you do that simply by hitting the return key or the, in this version of the software, the enter key uh, a couple times, and it will just go from one screen to the other. And I uh, designed this so that you could um, experience the entire novel by simply following a default route uh, through it. Second, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Uh, uh, a second way is by following links, just like you do on the web. And if you, you can see on this screen, the links, uh, many links are indicated visually as they are on the web today. So people are kind of used to that. StorySpace had another feature where you could have links that were not necessarily highlighted. And if you hold down the, sh the uh, uh, option and control keys, as I'm doing now, uh, links are are highlighted in wireframe boxes, and so there's some uh, there's one on this page that is not you know, that I haven't colored, and so that's another way to move through the uh, uh, th through the work. A third, oh, actually, and I'm going to show you that right now. By I'll click on the uh, dedication link, and you see that uh, the work is dedicated to my sister Carol Collins. And uh, thanks to critic Michael Tratner, my editor, Diane Greco at Eastgate, and thank you, my family. And then I'm going back to the instruction page. Um, uh, and uh, I'll show you another way to navigate. There's a, you may be able to see there's another screen behind the, uh, uh, the uh, instructions screen, and that is a map view of the work. And this is a feature of story space that um, I think attracted many of us to, to, to using the software because uh, a feature is that it creates a visual uh, uh, representation, a graphical representation of the hierarchical structure that you build and, and the linking structure uh, automatically. 
and uh, I think th this is a really exciting part of uh, using this using this software. You can see that the organization I've created for Figursky it consists of nine uh, root level or you know kind of base level directories that are indicated by these big boxes, and there's other little little uh, writing spaces inside those spaces. You can nest these and other spaces within those and so on. Those are all representing uh, spaces that have text and or images in them. Uh, so there's nine of those. You can see three are called well, three of them are called characters, places, and artifacts. And there's three other ones called 1.x, 2.x, 3.x. Uh, uh, you see it's highly organized and uh, I'll have more to, more to say about that. But you, the point is uh, for now that you can navigate from the map view if you want to look at the work structurally, you can click down through these uh, writing spaces uh, and, and see what's inside there. Um, and then um, the next way I want to highlight is uh, you can see at the bottom of the introduction uh, page there's a large uh, uh, font linked to a space called Navigator. I'm clicking on that. This is a uh, space that I created to help the reader navigate and through the, through the work and also uh, to um, make explicit the way it's structured. It's kind of like a table of contents page. And here we can see there's three, three options, three characters listed, three places listed, and three artifacts listed. And so, uh, what you can see here, and what I, I'll talk about this for just a, a couple minutes, is that um, these nine elements are, are make up the uh, main narrative in a combinatorial way. That is, uh, if you take, uh, the, it's called Figursky at Finhorn on Acid, which is one character at one place with one artifact. If you take one, two, or all three characters with one, two, or all three of the artifacts, at one of the places and every possible permutation or combination of that, you get a 147 possible scenarios. And that's what constitutes the main narrative of uh, Figursky. And in this way, it's kind of mimics uh, intertextuality in the sense of the idea that um, uh, texts are made from, all texts are made from other texts in different combinations, or the idea that language is made of really different uh, combinations of words and different rearrangements of words. So uh, in a way, you know, mimicking that by saying everything is made out of these nine elements. Um, the, um, I'll say just a couple more things about these nine elements because that's important to the uh, uh, conception of, of Figursky. Uh, um, Figurs, the, all three of the characters are, and you'll see some of them, I'll read in a second, are um, imitations of or derived from or extensions of uh, real life characters. They're fictional characters that are extensions of real life characters. Uh, two, uh, uh, one of the places, Findhorn, is a real place in Scotland, a, a community in Scotland. Uh, has anybody besides my wife and me, been to Finhorn, Scotland, by any chance? Okay. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, f other places is a real fictional place. Uh, that is the holodeck from the <laughs> fictional universe of Star Trek. So it's kind of like a real place, but it's a real fictional place. Uh, and the third place is a fictional place that's based on real places. It's, a, it's an apparitional site where a woman saw uh, uh, Jesus on her shower wall and uh, 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 became a shrine that people went to. So that's kind of based on real places. Among the artifacts, there's um, two real artifacts. First one, acid or LSD. Uh, how many people beside, no, no, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to answer that. Um, uh, and uh, spam, which is the meat uh, product spam, not the email type of spam. We have three cans of spam from my collection uh, back in the in the back here. Uh, another real artifact, and the third one is a an automaton 
a mechanical pig, a fictional one from the 18th century is based on um, real life automatons, although it's kind of a hyperbolic one uh, from the uh, 18th century. Okay. Um, lastly, I'll point to one more way that you might want to navigate it were you to come from this screen. You can see uh, there's an option for time options. And if we click on that, we see a list of timelines. And there's a chronology, and then there's 12 timelines. And uh, this indicates that there's some kind of chronology going on. And indeed, I'll say that there is an overall chronology and an overall timeline. And if we follow the default route, which we'll do in a second, it really f it follows a, a plot line. And this was unusual, I think, for hypertext in, in, in that uh, I w in, uh, have, in the, have imposed um, an overall chronology and a plot and there, that you can follow almost in a linear way. And so I try was trying to play with the tension between uh, linear plots and linear reading that people are used to from books and all the possibilities that are opened up by multilinearity and kind of give the reader a choice and, and play with the, ter the terrain in between those. Uh, these uh, timelines you can see occur in the 1990s. So there's 1993, a couple in 1994, a couple in 1997, and then year 2000. And then there's some star dates, which look like they're in the future, and, uh, but they actually can translate back to Gregorian star dates by an old formula that's not widely accepted. That meaning that a star date 0012 is the uh, same as December 2000. So they refer back to Gregorian dates. And a point here that is that the novel takes place in the 1990s up until the cusp of the 21st century, the year 2001. It was published in the year 2001, and it has exactly 2001 links. So again, um, uh, uh, kind of that's how I, I uh, was structuring things. So now I'm going to go back to the space where you, you enter in, and I'm going to start down the default route and then uh, read some of the screens that we encounter that way. So if you just start off and you just want to start reading, the first space you come to is called Figursky 1.x. It says, Francis. Frank Manypen's Figursky, paroled in 1993 at age 48 after serving only six years for killing Harvard mathematics professor Quentin Kingsley with a marble paperweight and a steel wastebasket. In a copycat crime echoing the case of Theodore Streleski at Stanford, admitted bringing a 16, and this is a typo, it's supposed to be 16 ounce claw hammer, 16 pounds would uh, be a little heavy to his faculty advising appointment, used by prosecutors as evidence of premeditation, but was convicted of second degree murder with, quote, diminished capacity under a Massachusetts law later repealed. Previously spent 21 years in graduate school without completing his PhD, dubbed Frank Many Pens by Canadian Sioux fellow grad student Jack Mounting Dog for his trademark overflowing pocket protector. Refused psychiatric treatment in jail. Said it in his unpublished memoir that he liked prison because he could think imaginatively within imposed limits. Uh, steadfastly maintained that the brutal beating death was a logical and moral reaction to his prolonged mistreatment as a Harvard graduate student. Added, again, eerily like Streleski, that Kingsley had made fun of his shoes, erroneously identified in news reports as wingtips. They were seamless Kinney's loafers with a spit shine on them, said the tall, handsome, shaved head Figursky in appearances on Good Morning America and Oprah Winfrey. In November 1993, the New York Transit Authority offered him a technician trainee position but withdrew the offer three weeks later. I'm going to hit the uh, default route again by hitting the return key. Findhorn. Findhorn 1.x is the name of this uh, screen. A new age intentional community on the Moray Firth in Scotland established in 1962 by Peter and Eileen Caddy, Dorothy McLean, 
uh, near the fishing village of Findhorn. Anecdotal accounts of the 60s and 70s told of remarkable gardens producing 40-pound cabbages, 60-pound broccoli plants, eight-foot delphiniums, and roses blooming in nothing but sand and snow. Love and communication with nature spirits, or divas, were credited with the horticultural miracles. The community attracted spiritual seekers from all over the world. In the 1980s, residents established educational programs and began planning an eco-village based on principles of sustainability and so on. The Findhorn Foundation promotes values of spirituality, ecology, and community summed up by the inspiration, work is love in action. According to former Findhorn resident, you are either manufacturing darkness through your own inner states of anxiety and fear and separation, or you are creating light and revelation through your abandonment of those past states and your attunement to new ones. And now acid. <laughs> Street name for LSD, a powerful hallucinogenic drug derived from a fungus that sometimes grows on rye, first synthesized by Albert Hoffman in 1938 used in psychiatric research as an adjunct to psychotherapy and in secret military experiments and a, as a potential weapon during the 1950s and 60s. Effects vary widely according to dosage, personality, and context, but may include increased impact of sensory stimuli, attention to normally un unnoticed aspects of the environment, the sense of time slowing down, uh, impaired short-term memory, enhanced long-term memory and introspection, changes in sense of self and ego, a sense of separation of mind and body, or a sense of unity with the environment and the universe. Increased also emotional effects, increased susceptibility to suggestion, heightened sensitivity, and magnification and purification of feelings such as love, lust, sympathy, gratitude, terror, despair, anger, or loneliness. At higher dosages, these effects may bring on paranoia, fear of loss of control, and panic, or euphoria and bliss. And now we've had so descriptions of three of those. And now we come to the first um, narrative screen, one called 1.1.01. And this is the eponymous uh, 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 Lexia Figursky at Findhorn on acid uh, and taking place in December 1993 and notice all that there's links to all those things Phoenix shop at the park Findhorn which sells books, crafts, natural foods and remedies background music playing uh, <laughs> we, we have a we have a Multimedia effect here. Yeah. I got sidetracked. That's good, but mostly because I can't sing. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> nice. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Figursky. Duffel over shoulder, absorbed by a seashell on a shelf of trinkets. Whoa. Wow. Hmm. Clerk, community member. Hey, man, are those wingtips? So continuing on the default route, we would come next to, um, come next to a description of one of the other nine elements. Oh, you may have noticed, too, that there's other options for each of these elements links listed down below. And this is show, uh, from this you can see that each of the nine elements has three iterations. And those are three iterations, uh, additional descriptions that occur over those timelines. In other words, uh, for a later timeline, there's an additional description. Um, and uh, uh, spam, I'm not going to read this, but it uh, basically is a description of... of uh, of spam, the meat, uh, canned meat product, uh, spiced uh, ham. What is it? Not scientifically produced animal matter. Doesn't <laughs> doesn't doesn't stand for that. Um, 
And uh, I'm going to go ahead to uh, then. There's a there's a um, actually. Do you have the other? Uh, yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. So there's a there's a there's a narrative here, and also in the form of a playlet, in which uh, Figursky is still at Finhorn. And, and he encounters the Monty Python spam video. No, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's playing in the background. And there's an echo. There we go. Those of us, at least of a certain generation, we remember. Fagursky's not too happy about this, Fugursky's suffice it to happy. say. Thank you. Um, and then I, I'm going to read this uh, The next in the default route. We now have the first description of Rosalini's 1737 Mechanical Pig. This is very important to the novel, central to the novel. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and read this. Sophisticated automaton designed and built by veterinarian engineer Guillermo Rosalini of Venice that convincingly and accurately walked, blinked, swam, snorted, rooted, ate, digested, and even defecated through an anatomically correct and fully functional anus, <laughs> drew crowds when exhibited in major European cities through the 1740s, fueling both religious outrage and intellectual debates about artificial life. About one meter long, the pig was operated by a complex and largely invisible system of hand cranks, gears, pulleys, and clock mechanisms said to comprise 147 moving parts. Unfortunately, the if you recall, the 147 is also the number of spaces in the main narrative and the number of possible combinations of three, th three, and three. Uh, unfortunately, the exact design remains somewhat of a mystery. Later, roboticists have been able to study only a handful of descriptions by contemporaneous scholars and historical eyewitnesses because Rosalini's mechanical pig, along with Rosalini's drawings and notebooks, and indeed Rosalini himself, was apparently destroyed in a 1752 Rome hotel fire. Persistent rumors that the pig escaped the fire and has been held ever since by private collectors were seemingly verified by an uncannily similar automaton shown at the 1889 Paris exhibition, later alleged to be a forgery crafted in 1884, by brilliant Dutch puppeteer Gilbert van Geldershot. Now, I'm going to just show you, since you might be tempted to click on one of these other things, so I'm going to go ahead and click on pig 2.x. And this is a dish, uh, goes on to describe another iteration of, about the mechanical pig. Um, in, in the middle of it, it says that uh, someone pr pub uh, proposed that Rosalini supposed 147 moving parts were organized around nine basic components, three of which remain relatively fixed in place. The components ingeniously combined one, two, and three at a time to reproduce such movements as blinking, swimming, or defecating. A crude mechanical approximation of object-oriented programming, etc. And so I uh, just sh kind of uh, cherry picking here to, to emphasize that uh, as actually as a um, uh, as uh, Michael Chatner's pointed out, that the pig is a is a is a metaphor for the novel, and um, is a, you know uh, an example of uh, how the novel tends to, uh, to be very uh, self-referential, and many things are describing the novel at the same time that they're describing other things. Um, so now I'm going to go back, if that's possible, to go back in this version of Story Space. You hold the shift key down and click on this double arrow. Yes, it worked. Um, and uh, now continuing with the default route from the description of Rosalini's pig, there's a, um, there's a narrative about Figursky encountering uh, the, um, a crate holding uh, a mechanical pig, so, uh, Rosalini's mechanical pig, apparently, on the beach in Finhorn. This is when he first encounters it. And uh, towards the end, it says, uh, we can only try to imagine the instantaneous connection that Frank Figursky feels with this artificial creation. 
violating his parole at isolated, windswept, idealistic Findhorn. He kneels down and wraps his long arms around the mechanical pig to protect it from the blowing sand and salty air as dramatic music plays in his head. Uh, so what's starting is, uh, I, I mentioned these, uh, the over, that there was an overall plot and uh, that um, uh, along these timelines and what's starting here is, is, a, is a quest story in which the three characters are contending uh, to possess this very valuable mechanical pig and they're competing with each other uh, and uh, to possess a pig and p possibly the an exact duplicate uh, and they contending with outside forces as well so that's really the overall plot and that's what has that's what's kind of starting up here uh, this uh, I'm still continuing with the default route hitting the uh, enter key and now there's a, uh, uh, a narrative all in dialogue with Figursky hitchhiking a ride with a Scottish man carrying the pig. And the screen, the title is Figursky at Finhorn on Acid with Spam. Notice it's got 1.2.01. The, the, the numerical scheme you may start to suspect means something. 1.2 means one character at a time with two of the artifacts. So there's 27 of those, I just happen to know. <laughs> um, and so 1.2.1 through 1.2.27. Um, and that's another way that I'm showing the structure and uh, the, the structural aspects. And so now I'm going to continue on. This is 1.2.02. Figursky at Finhorn on acid with Rosalini's mechanical pig. And in this narrative, Figursky performs at the Universal Hall for Friday night sharing. Um, and uh, I'll, go ahead and, I'll go ahead and read this. Uh, Friday night sharing at Universal Hall. Eclectic centerpiece of Finhorn, handcrafted of local stone and wood and stained glass, symbolically pentagonal spiritually and astronomically aligned as an attractive landing site for t extraterrestrials. Like an international talent show on the stage dance floor, theater in the round, actually triangle, Shana from Sweden singing a little help from my friends, big hug from Gudrun of Germany who does a modern dance interpreting three Gregorian chants, Zed from Amsterdam doing stand-up comedy on theme of winter solstice zazen. Then Figursky from Walpole with the amazing mechanical pig whose production will be second to none. When Mr. F performs his tricks without a sound, of course, Francis the pig dances a jig. Um, so if we hold down the, as I mentioned before, the option and the control keys, see there's a bunch of hidden links as well as regular links on this page. Um, that we could follow. For example, if we clicked on Universal Hall, you get actual photographs of Universal Hall at Finhorn with a uh, fictional quote from a non-fictional looking source, author look authoritative looking source. Uh, this is an example, this, this is called 010. You might not know what that means, but it's from a, another directory of notes, footnotes, and meta commentary on the main narrative. And so, actually, that could lead me now to explain. I said there's 147 nodes in the main narrative. There's also this parallel uh, directory with 147 notes and meta commentary about the main narrative. That is 294 plus 60 spaces that are descriptive. The, some of the descriptive spaces I've said that describe the elements and navigational spaces, like the navigator space, uh, 60 of those, you add those up, that's 354, and uh, that's why there's 354 spaces. If, uh, anyway, um, now I'm going to go back to, so we can go back to the screen we came from, and I'm going to click on the link at the bottom, uh, one of the links at the bottom, who's universal sharing, 
And this goes to another note, 039, and it says it's called 1.2.02. That looks like the screen we came from. 0 0.01, so it's a variation on that. This is one of these meta commentary notes. And it's called On 1993 Mechanical Figursky with Rosalini's December Acid Pig. <laughs> Looks like the same thing, but in a different order. And so here I'm, you can see if we read this, um, I'll just read a little bit of it. Who's Universal Sharing Night at an astronomically aligned Finhorn Hall? Like Friday, the eclectic local extraterrestrial singing of stone in the round hall. Amazing universal chants on theme of doing international tricks. A second to none big hug from Zazen Gudrun, symbolically without a sound. And it goes on, um, and uh, you may, can guess that the words look the same as the screen we came from. So this is an exact anagram, all exactly the same words, but arranged in a different, hopefully syntactically sensible way, but poetically so would be the intention to be a, a, a kind of a, a poetic uh, anagram of the previous space. Uh, again, uh, for me anyway, emphasizing the rearrangement of language. Um, so I'm going to go back again. Oops. Go back and uh, continue a little bit more with the default route. Fogersky at Finhorn with Spam and Rosalini's 1737 Mechanical Pig. I'm not going to read this uh, narrative, but this is a uh, uh, first person narrative inside Fogersky's uh, brain uh, talking about his performance uh, with the pig on the Finhorn stage in which he fed it Spam, because uh, this is Spam and the pig. And he fed it spam and uh, demonstrated its uh, uh, amazing automaton uh, <laughs> abilities to process the spam through its automaton body. Uh, the Finhorn people were less than pleased, as, as it turns out, but that, that will uh, occur eventually. And now each of these initial, now we're at 1.3.01, so that means that one character with, and it's, it's still Fogersky, it could be another character, but this is Fogersky with all three of the artifacts. <laughs> all of these threads end with a questions for discussion <laughs> section. And so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's also the no hands cup flipper with these three things and there's also, and they, they all end with uh, questions for discussion. And so I wanted to share one of them with you. Uh, one, in 50 words or fewer, compare and contrast the video waitress's fixation with spam as reflected in the Findhorn clerk's obsession with the Python comedy sketch in terms of electromagnetic forces of attraction and <laughs> repulsion at work in the text between Fogersky, that is mass matter, and Finhorn, curved space-time. <laughs> I wonder if that's a link. Oh, yes. So if you see there's a, there's a link off into the notes section about curved space-time, which we're not going to follow. Two, turn off the lights. Everyone who thinks that the Finhorn pig, which Fogersky almost literally digs up in December 1993, is actually the Van Geldershot forgery rather than the genuine original Rosalini, please huddle on one side of the room, remove an article of clothing, <laughs> and a point of facilitator. You don't have to. You don't have to do this. Uh, and a point of facilitator to gather these in a large trash, a large bag from Target. All those who think that the pig in the story is indeed the Rosalini, please remain seated. Blindfold yourself with the black eye shades provided. Pass around and withdraw a clothing article at random from the other group's target bag. <laughs> then redress yourself, <laughs> substituting the new item for a piece of your own. Turn the lights back on and discuss. Three, how would you characterize the relationship between Fogersky's personal demons and the pan-like nature spirits dancing along the edges of the Finhorn ether. To what extent do you think that the work requirement for short-term guests at the park, which is never explicitly mentioned in the text, should be modified to prevent future hammer murderers from hitching rides with colorful local characters such as the spam-eating Highlander who picks up Fogersky? Defend your answer with a semi-automatic weapon purchased through a right-wing British hunting survivalist magazine. Um, 
the, one of the four, many uh, genres that are explore, I explore in, in the novel is academic language and pedagogical language and academic language. And uh, uh, so uh, that's uh, you know, one, uh, one example. Um, so let's see how are we doing for time. So I thought we thought at this point um, we might try something that uh, I tried with the early performances of Figursky in the early 2000s, and uh, that is to involve the audience uh, in um, helping it kind of navigating through the hypertext. And the idea is that uh, I have this beach ball, <laughs> and, and the idea, you know, nobody really knew and maybe still knows how to perform uh, uh, hypertext because it's an experience with, you know, somebody on a screen, and how do you replicate that, and how do you make it interesting for, a, uh, for, a, for an audience in this type of situation. So what I did, and I got this idea from an editor at Eastgate, Diane Greco, which is I put some of the different navigational choices I've been talking about are written on this beach ball, and the idea is I'm going to throw it out into the audience, somebody's going to catch it, and then you're going to decide how we're going to go from here. And so it's, you know, it's risky, but we'll give it a try. <laughs> I may, and I, and I retain veto power, uh, too, in this, in this uh, scenario. Um, and so are you game? Are you game for that? Okay, so, I don't, I, you know, this, okay. Here we go. We'll give it a try. We'll see how we end up. So, Ronnie's caught the beach ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Artifacts. What's that? Artifacts. Okay, so let's see. We have to get to artifacts. I have to move through the through I'm gonna go to the navigator. I actually don't know how to get oh I know how to do it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go to the map view and I'm gonna click on the artifacts screen and then it calls it it points to it it shows all three artifacts so then now you have to pick another one you have to pick which artifact Damn. okay so we've already seen spam 1.x so i'll let you get us out of this loop oh. if you want to keep going Right. Okay. Now, why don't you toss the okay. toss the <laughs> beach ball? <laughs> you okay? Is it okay? Okay. So here's the map view, and then I'm gonna, you know, let you point us where you want to go in the map view. What, and and may, I'll make a slight suggestion, which is maybe you want to look at some uh, areas where there's more than one character, uh, so either two or three characters. Um, or I I these, uh, uh, and a further hint, 1.x is one character at a time, 2.x is two characters at a time, and 3.x is all three characters. Yeah. So that one. Three? Yes. Okay, so let's look at three at this uh, space. And now there's, there's uh, uh, links, again, a navigational um, a space. Three characters, one place, one artifact. Three characters, one place, two. So you want to pick one of those? Let's do 3.2. All right. Let's we'll see what happens here. And now another, there's a little table of contents. Of, <laughs> and there's happen to be nine possibilities of that. And so uh, I'll just click on the first. Now let's go back. Do you, you can pick one if you want. Let's do six. Okay, 3.2.06. So that means three characters, uh, two artifacts, and it happens to be Figursky, 
well, all three characters, Vygursky, the no-hands cup flipper, and <laughs> Fatima, Michelle, Vyashanje, you haven't met them, so a thing we might do if we have time is go back and, and, and read those screens so you know a little bit about them. On the hollow deck, which we haven't visited yet, with Spam and Rosalini's 1737 Mechanical Pig, it's star date 0012.06. Uh, and so it's a s hollow deck program we've come upon with uh, all three characters involved, pretty advanced in the uh, in the uh, time frame of the novel. Disclaimer: While we cannot accept liability for any lost data or other real or perceived injury, your feedback is very important to us. Throughout this testing process, you may encounter specific questions or prompts and your generous responses will help make Vygursky, the No Hands Cup Flipper, and Fatima Michelle Vyashanje on the holodeck with Spam and Rosalini's 1737 <laughs> Mechanical Pig a better experience for everyone. Your lack of response to any scenario will be considered uncooperative and may be interpreted as hostile. <laughs> Ted, now uh, I, I, I happen to know, of course, uh, that what's happening here is the three characters, Figursky, No Hands, Cup Flipper, and Fatima, Michelle, Vishanje, are reverting in the holodeck. They're playing their originals that they're based on from real life. So Ted is Ted uh, Streleski, and that, so that's Figursky is playing Ted Strelet, is reverting to Ted Streleski. Jean is uh, a uh, man who performed cup flipping at a roadside attraction that is uh, the base is a character that the no hands cup flipper is imitating. And Michel is a real French explorer from the 1930s who disguised himself as a woman, Michel Vyachange, uh, to travel to a forbidden area in southern Morocco. He disguised himself as a Berber woman and uh, he uh, was the kind of original for Fatima Michelle Vishanje. So sorry for the, but otherwise you you'd be at this point you're like who's Ted, who's Jean, and who's Michelle. So you would theoretically you would know that. Although if you, you this is a good example of how if you navigate the hypertext in a random way, you may be puzzled, right? And so you might go, you might want to, I don't know if 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 we were reading it this way, we might want to go back and read about these characters. So without all that, Ted says, let's pop them open, pop them, pop them, pop them, pop them, pop them, pop them, pop them. It probably refers to spam. Gene, I remember, I remember now, but how did we manage to get them all so professionally resealed when we put the little clockwork gears in there? Unbelievable. If someone brought these, bought these at the store, they couldn't tell the difference from the real thing. Michelle, processed meat, extremely long shelf life, recyclable aluminum, the perfect disguise, messieurs. Okay, you want to go ahead and toss the, toss, toss the ball? Good job, thank you. Yeah, we'll, do, we'll try one more. Let's go to characters. Okay, so let's see if I can get there. So what I would do to get to characters from here is I would click on the timeline because I know I can get to the navigator from there and I can get to characters, well, I got there from the map view. So there's the characters uh, are all listed. Would you want to explore one of them? Let's do the no hands one. Okay. And so clicking on that goes to the first one, which is Cup Flipper 1.x. And this is what I was starting to explain. Uh, this is Nguyen Van To, admirer and imitator of Eugene Zanger, the eccentric resident performance artist of Casa de Fruta, a 120-acre family-run roadside attraction on Pacheco Pass along 150, Highway 152 near Gilroy, California. Um, has anyone been to Casa de Fruta? <laughs> Besides, um, okay. Um, uh, as eatery manager and coffee host, Zanger began flipping cups by accident during a busy shift in August 1973 
then started performing full cup rotations, occasionally occasional double flips and upon request bi-directional coffee pot spins. And Costa de Fruta became the home of the world famous cup flipper for a generation of travelers. Zanger's 300 plus flips a day for 15 years were enough to land him on the David Letterman show in 1987. Oh, true fact is uh, um, when a boat person immigrant who'd lost both hands as a toddler during the war, Vietnam War, then became a talented footbagger after getting laid off from his San Jose chip factory job, saw Zanger on Letterman and was inspired. Hired as a busboy at Casa de Coffee, Nguyen studied Zanger's technique and spent all his free time practicing with restaurant breakage, becoming adept with both arm stubs as well as his hacky sack trained feet. He expanded his repertoire to include triple flips with delicate china and Japanese ceremonial teacups then took his show on the road. People who saw both of them said that the student surpassed his aging master. They also said that both cup flippers strangely resembled Texas billionaire Ross Perot. <laughs> Nguyen, of course, in a more Indo-Chinese way. Uh, um, okay. Uh, anybody want to, you want to give, give it one more toss? We'll do one more from the, from the audience. If we have, oh. <laughs> 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 get to, and there's the three places listed. Okay. Um, another uh, option here, so this is a description of the Enterprise holodeck pretty much as it is about uh, how you can replicate things there and, and imitate reality and create scenarios. So setting this up as one of the places where the characters can go and do all those things. If I were to click on holodeck options, then you see that it will go to um, you know, a, another set of options where the holodeck is involved. So, um, all right. I think that I think that uh, was f I hopefully was fun, <laughs> and uh, I can uh, I can go. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your participation in that. I, I can I can show a few more. Yeah, I think we've got another five minutes, maybe. Okay. So let's see. In five minutes, what would I show you? I might. Um, Uh, go to, uh, go to the navigator. I'm going to go to, uh, let's see, let's look at some timelines and, um, maybe, um, December 2000. So, uh, so this is near the end of the novel, and uh, all three characters are there. You can see three. It's a three. It is in the three area, and the um, Fogersky, the No Hands Cup Flipper, and Fatima Michelle Vishanje at Shower Lord on Acid Picture Book, <laughs> and so this is a series uh, with uh, child drawings and imitating a child's picture book, and they're putting the um, um, uh, pieces, uh, pieces of the mechanical pigs back together again after fighting over them for a very long time. It says, see Frank and Toe and Fatima. They're camping by a trailer park. They pitch a tent. They unfold camp chairs. In Florida, it is warm and flat and swampy. Frank takes out a tiny piece of film. It is smaller than your fingernail. He cuts it into three pieces. I cut, you choose, Frank says to the others. I'll take this one, says Toe. I'll take this one, says Fatima. They all put their little piece of film on their tongue and swallow. It looks like they are eating tiny movies. <laughs> See, and this is uh, the same, all three, at Shower Lord with Spam Picture Book. 
uh, see Frank dig in the soft swampy ground by their tent, see Toe and Fatima dig too. What are they digging for? Clang goes Frank's shovel. Clang, clang go Toe's and Fatima's shovels. Only a few more left, Frank says. Here's another one, says Toe, and another, says Fatima. They wipe the mud off with the towels so they can read the numbers on the cans. They have now found all the spam they buried here before. They uh, buried spam cans with a uh, servo mechanism parts, special parts that uh, run the uh, uh, mechanical pig that they had divided up and had buried them and now they're, they're re-getting them, giving away. It's like a spoiler, spoiler alert. Um, and read one more. Gursky, no hands, cup flipper, and Fatima Michelle Vishanjay at Shower Lord with Rosalini's 1737 mechanical pig picture book. See the Lorax double wide. That is the um, uh, apparitional site called Shower Lord. It's in a double wide trailer in a F Florida trailer park. Here's the bathroom inside the trailer. Can you see the picture of Jesus hidden in the glue pattern on the wall of the shower stall? Here is the Smidley's double wide number 16Z across the street. Why are all the reporters and TV camera crews here? Frank and Toe and Fatima are there too. Mr. and Mrs. Smidley have an announcement to make. They have seen a vision in the torn insulation hanging from the aluminum rafters above their linen closet. It is the image of Rosalini's 1737 <laughs> mechanical pig. Actually, that's probably a good place to, it's a good place to stop. Thanks, Richard, for that wonderful reading. That was that was great. It's such a complex piece, and everyone online is just commenting about, you know, how how much structure, how deep the structure is, how much, you know, much work went into thinking through the structure. Um, a really easy question. Let's start with though: is what did yeah. you make the pictures with? In the in the last bit, they were asking if you made it with MS. I think MS Word, and they were. There's lots of conjecture about how you produce those. In the, the, the last yeah, little section. Yeah. Uh, how did I make those? I mean, with crayons <laughs> is, is, is what I remember. And uh, uh, I don't know what software I used. I don't remember how I what made those. Would have been those. Like, um, like maybe early, like make draw, make paint? Because that would have been the right time. Well, that would have been maybe early Adobe? I mean, now I would like draw something and take a picture with my yeah. iPhone. I don't remember what I did to make the to put them in there. I worked hard at it. I remember that. Yeah. And to, yeah. Well, I have a question from Ricardo. He's one of the graduate PhD students at uh, uh, Pullman campus. He's taking electronic literature class. And he's asking, how do you prep readers for this kind of online lit experience? Uh, or is it all about experiential reading? And I think that's a really good question because there's just so much, right? How do you prep readers for yeah, it? Yeah, how do you prep them? I mean, how do you get people ready for this experience? Uh, Can you for performing it or yeah. for them reading it? On Any, the, I think both, right? I, I mean, I think readers today are much more prepared for it just because it's so uh, because of all the experience in the culture with the web. Um, so it's not um, uh, it's it's become naturalized, you know, for in reading experiences to follow links and the notion of hypertext is all, is, is getting pretty naturalized. So it, 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 and you know, in the 1990s, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, uh, 
I don't know what what other preparation. It's hard, isn't it? I mean, um, even today, it's hard to get you know folks to understand how to move through a piece and read it in bits and pieces, even though we're getting used to it with games. I mean, games prepares mm -hmm. us in some way, right? Sure. Uh, I was trying to, with uh, my work, I was trying to make the structure so visible and so transparent that you could, after a while, you could see, uh, you could understand the structure so well that you could navigate easily and find anything. Both a combination of the numbering scheme mm -hmm. and the graphical representation mm -hmm. of it, uh, and it, with regard to story space in particular. Yeah. yeah. So, not Miss So Average writes here, if you could go back and change this piece, what would you change? Uh, gosh, that's, that's a great question. Would you change uh, anything of it? Well, I think uh, that, that the interface looks, uh, you know, doesn't look great today by today's standards. It's not, a, it's not a, a clean and easy interface, and we have a lot cleaner, nicer uh, looking stuff. And that um, I would lo it would love to uh, have the interface cleaned up, and I, I I'm I'm pr pretty happy with the content. I know that uh, in this, you know, performance that people only get a sampling of it, but um, I've you know been rereading it, and I'm 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 pretty pleased with with what happens and and how I structured it, and it would be really great to have a nice clean. Uh, uh, interface that uh, could be out there easy for people to use. Yeah. Well, people are using Twine now, and Twine looks so much like this environment. Mm -hmm. um, very much so, right? Yeah. 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 So Jazz Jackson writes, what tools have you, would you have utilized if you had made Pogursky today? So I think that's right in line to what we're talking about. If you could redo this now, what would you make it in? Uh, I think... I would, yes, possibly, I, uh, uh, a possibility would be, well, StorySpace is still uh, so capable. I know. It's such great uh, <coughs> software. Uh, what I would do is port it from StorySpace uh, into HTML, I yeah. think. Which is possible and with then, StorySpace. And then, you know, work with a designer if I wasn't capable of doing the, uh, the making it um, beautiful to look at and use, uh, work with a designer to, to, to make it so. Yeah. Question from the on-site audience. Anybody have questions here before I keep going through the <laughs> questions? Yes, okay. Ian. How long did it take for you to write all that? Uh, it was kind of in stages, uh, but uh, if I had to say, estimate uh, five years, probably. It started as a short story, a flash fiction in print uh, uh, with a story called Streleski at Finhorn on Acid, which was based on the real, which is about the real, the Theodore Streleski uh, that Figursky is an imitation of. Um, and that was published in 1996. And so pretty much from there, I started working on it until it was uh, published in 2001. Different versions uh, were workshopped in different ways and, um, and so on. So Richard yeah. Snyder asks us, Strikes me that hypertext like this closely align with philosophy, which places importance on assemblage and the agency of objects. Do you consider objects like spam characters in a novel like this? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. yeah. Good. Good uh, theoretical question. I'm not. You know. I'm going to. You know, tend to leave those uh, questions to the to the literary critics. I think with uh, expertise in that in that area, but I like the question a lot. Yeah, good. Another question from the audience here. Anybody? Yes, please. A lot of information presented in your novel. Do you feel most readers kind of go through the general timeline as you present it and then go back and deviate off into these different areas? You know, to get the gist of the whole story, maybe, and then retreat? I don't know. Uh, the f folks who have uh, written about it, the critics who have written about it, uh, have read it closely enough to, you know, to to get that. Um, I, f I I wonder if I if I haven't made the um, the plot uh, uh, obvious enough 
because it, 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 people get distracted by uh, the dis there's many distractions and especially when um, scenarios take place on the hollow deck they get kind of pretty crazy and um, what I'm hoping that the reader is going to find is that to read through that to see that there is stuff happening that is building in the plot that there's actually you know uh, uh, elements being added so um, did, uh, comment appreciate the tutorials where you stated a place but there was a photo mm -hmm. uh -huh. that was cool instantly you know instead of having to google it <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> uh, yeah there's more there there's there's very few images well I, there, there's those drawing a few draw those drawings i showed but otherwise, uh, 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 the images that are in it are all in the notes section, the kind of those footnotes and meta commentary. So online, Nazwa, who's a PhD student in Pullman, writes, Hi, Richard, do you have some insights how immersive this piece of elit can be for the readers? Uh, I mean, that's really, I, I don't know. That's a really, <laughs> that's a question <laughs> for the, what, what, what is, can we, can we uh, have dialogue? Can I ask him yeah. what he thinks her. about her? Yeah. Sorry. Can I ask her what, you know, what kind of immersiveness she felt or, you know, to what extent she felt there was? I mean, I I immersiveness in this case is a textual immersiveness, right? So it's, 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 only immersive to the same extent that any text can be immersive, immersive to me because I mean it's really it's really a text a work of text it's a, it's a literary work so it's like reading a novel or a story can you get immersed to that I don't know that uh, the hypertext medium affects the immersiveness that much yeah I was thinking you know this is a novel so you know you don't just take a novel and stand in front of an audience and read the novel and, and most of the times, if you go to readings um, of novels, people open up a chapter somewhere in the middle, and they just start reading. And you really don't get a lot of context. You have to, there might be some preface, you know, I'm reading from chapter seven, and by this point, the, you know, the main character does this. And, and so there's a little bit of context, and you just start listening. And I think we're so used to that kind of immersion, you know, the aural aspect of it, when we do something like hypertext, it seems weird because you're not, he's not standing with a book in his hand. He's in front of a computer and you're watching it on a screen, so there's almost something television-like, film-like, cinematic-like. And it, I think that's the part that seems <coughs> odd. Well, here's some additional yeah. thoughts about that. So, you know, what we're playing with in these short snippets of text is the way that people tend to read today which is really short things. Mm -hmm. And my creative challenge in, in this combinatorial approach was, you know, what, if you buy into this combinatorics as you're seeing it unfold, can each scenario be a st kind of stand on its own and be a prose poem uh, 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 and, uh, gra you know, uh, immerse, be immersive, uh, grab the reader, and make you want to read more of those. And so there's a real, it really is different from a novel because it's so episodic and uh, so carved up. And uh, that was, you know, uh, uh, really the challenge and, and maybe the potential of this to be immersive is, is, you know, buying into that and then having each thing work on its own but build towards something greater. So Emmadin writes, um, he says, Hello, Richard, if you were given were to give advice to students creating works and pieces now, what advice would that be and why? Like, what, what, what would you tell him? Works in pieces? Works and pieces. Works and pieces. So, so students creating something. What advice would you give them today? Well, follow your, follow your <laughs> passions. Uh, what do you want to, I'd say, ask yourself, what do you want to say? Uh, what do you what what are you passionate about? What do you want to write about? And then find a form that um, that works for you. I've I've never settled been able to settle on a form. I've always moved from form to form to form. So when I had to do a lot of PowerPoint presentations in my job, I started writing PowerPoint fiction because it, I saw mm -hmm. I've seen everything that I've encountered as as a narrative. Um, 
uh, form that has the potential to be poetic or fictional or creative. And uh, so um, I'm not a good person to follow <laughs> advice on, uh, on that. Uh, but so I haven't you know, really found a form. Uh, I keep moving from form, from, uh, form to form. I have a question. So when Dina Larson was here doing um, samplers with us last month or a month and a half ago, which seems like yesterday, she was t we talked about structure equal, you know, structure equals meaning. So a lot about hypertext is the way it's structured. And one of the things that we encountered when we were practicing this piece uh, in the lab before you came here to do this traversal was some of the structural elements in the piece. For example, the way you structured whole letters with words, and that provided some sort of hint about the story. So like the word et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, I'd like to get that on video because I think that's just so cool to talk about. Will you sure. comment about that? Sure. What, uh, 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 what you're uh, talking about is <clears throat> the notes section, which is, if you remember, is one of the nine directories. And if you look at the map view and you click on the notes section, you then get nine subdirectories. Again, everything divisible by three. And if you click on one of those, it has a certain number of writing spaces, again, contained within it. And remember that visual representation in story spaces is these little boxes. Well, the boxes in each of those directories are arranged in ways to form letters. So there's nine of those, again, nine, nine of those sections of notes um, and uh, so they spell out the word that one, one, uh, the first, the second one is an, shaped as an E. The boxes, the writing boxes are literally arranged as an E. If you click in them, there's text inside them, but together they all form the letter E. And uh, then T and then C and spells out over the whole notes directory the word et cetera which somebody's going to figure out quickly is only eight letters. Uh, <laughs> so the first one is shaped as a doorway or entryway, and then it's followed by eight letters, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, the best way to see this would be visually, but I'm not sure if I described it such that you can picture it, but the, something that, that uh, is influenced by the medium, right? Uh, the medium really constructs gives you, you know, constraint, both constraints and opportunities. And w what I saw in just playing with, well, w in story space, you're creating these boxes that represented vi uh, these writing spaces. You're writing in them, but then when you look at a structure uh, uh, from the map view, there are these little boxes, and you can move them around the screen. So I just did what visual poets have done, which is I moved them around in the shape of letters. Um, very few readers have noticed that, but it's the kind of thing I like to build in to be can be discovered if you know if you if you want and you guys disco it. <laughs> discovered it. <laughs> We're real sensitive to it after Dina's visit. I have two good questions here I want to ask, and then we'll, that probably will end our question and answer. But uh, to Pe Peoki, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Do you think this work would function as a printed novel effectively? That's a great question. And what would you consider the pros and cons of that? So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I've printed it. <laughs> um, thank you for that question. Uh, and um, so, I think so because personally, and I'm obviously biased. Uh, I think so because I think it, wor it works in the way that I was describing, which is following a default route there is a plot that builds up and the idea is really you have a series of prose poems in different with different genres and so on and if you if those work individually I do think that they work in a line to me they work in a linear way also Good. and so in that sense it doesn't have to be a hypertext and we have a copy of that printed novel in the in the exhibit on campus here so if you want to see that we do have it um, and then one more question. Hello from WSUV's ELIT class. Hmm. Richard expressed he made a linear path, which isn't typical of hypertext. Does he recommend doing a first reading following the linear path through the, through yeah, the work? Yeah, that's a great question, and yes, I do. 
you know, really, because I've seen people get, and just even today, it was hard to, for, I think, for people to get a sense of the mm -hmm. overall thing, because we're jumping around, you're going, well, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that's always been said about hypertext is that when you read a, the same tech, the same <coughs> node, the same Lexia, uh, having come from path A, but then you, if you read it having not seen those other screens before that, you're really reading a different text because you have a different context around it. And um, I think in my case, I do re recommend that, and that is how some uh, readers have, have read it. When Michael Joyce called that way of reading the wave of returns, you just keep hitting the return key, and you're taken through this whole mm -hmm. path, this wave of, of, of story. And that was one way to read through most of the hypertext that I know of, right? I mean, Michael Joyce's work, Bill Bly's work, but it's the one they want you to resist because they really want, a lot of art, artists really want you to, to get the feeling of moving around and that's that cut up poetry, cut up fiction mm -hmm. experience, right? Well, they were using story space in a different way yeah. than I was, and they were using a feature of story space called guard fields, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, was a way of. Uh, preventing you from seeing certain lexia until you saw other ones. So you could put conditions on, You can in story space you can put conditions around seeing this space, you're not allowed to see this until you see these other ones. And in some of those uh, earlier works, there would be spaces you would never, you might never see, or you could, and, and it was also very hard to tell when you had finished mm -hmm. or if you had seen everything. And uh, that was something I've consciously was uh, not doing, uh, I was consciously uh, showing everything, make, trying to make all this, everything transparent, which is another reason I was, I'm not uncomfortable with people just following a default route. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody for being here today. It's exciting to have <laughs> Richard and his wife, Ronnie, here visiting us for the last three days. Um, we covered a lot of territory. He, uh, I want to mention and go on record saying in front of everybody at the vi in, on video that Richards donated his papers to the Electronic Literature Organization. And so we've been spending the last, I don't know, three months, two months going through the papers, getting everything um, noted, inventoried, and it'll go into the Electronic Literature Repository as one of the collections of the ELO. And it's been very wonderful to have this ability to preserve not just this work, but all the works that you've produced and all the writings and, you know, everything from contracts to, you know, the things that you have developed over the course of your career. There's lots and lots of journals that he's given us with his work in it. And currently we have an exhibit of his work that's in the second floor of uh, the VMMC building. So if you want to come and see the beach balls and the spam and everything else that we have there, please come. We're going to be taking and making a change with that exhibit next week, week after next, um, and putting up a new show. So come and see the exhibit this week. I'd love to have you um, visit the lab anytime you want and contact us if you want to make a trek here. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Ronnie.